Welcome to Toastmasters Bay to Bay, serving Toastmaster clubs from the Golden Gate to Monterey. I am your host, Chris Pond. In America, you have freedom of speech. In Toastmasters, you experience it. The difference is you are given structured feedback, and it is this evaluation that not only sets you up to shine, but to shine again. Tonight, we are going to see two examples of this from veteran speakers. And the first one here is going to do not a speech, but I hear she's going to do a little bit more than that. We'll call it a presentation. Here now with our first present presenter, the speech is titled from the Competent Communicator Manual number eight, called Get Control Visual Aids, instead of Get Control with Introducing Speakers. Please welcome here to present, you can never have too many shoes, Birgit Starmans. Thank you. One of the conspirators in the Italian job, the movie, said that with his millions, he wants a house with a room just for his shoes. I could go for something like that. Now at this point, you're probably thinking, how many shoes do you have in your closet? Flats, different colors, high heels if you're a woman. How many of you are actually counting those shoes that you need for sporting events? Your cross trainers, your golf shoes, your tennis shoes for tennis, your tennis shoes for jogging. Every kind of sport has a different kind of shoe. Well, the thing is about dancing, the same is true. Depending on what kind of dance style you use, you actually have different shoes. So the more types of dancing that you try out, the more shoes you're going to have. Enough for a room. Now, how do you carry these shoes around? Because you can't really run around with all these shoes separately, right? Well, this is where we have something called a dance bag. The dance bag's purpose is to help you carry your shoes. In my case, usually a pair of rehearsal shoes, a pair of performance shoes, a backup pair of performance shoes. You never know when something's going to break. But the wonderful thing about these things is that it's kind of a status symbol. You're in a show. You're actually not just using it for shoes, but for warm-up clothes, for curling irons, for mousse, for makeup, you name it. This is your dance bag, everything that you need to perform. Well, the first style of dance for which I needed a bag was tap dance. And the first pair of shoes that I had, I was seven years old. Now, tap shoes are not usually sold as being silver. At that age, you're growing out of your shoes basically every single year. So at the end of the year, you get to spray paint them with silver or gold or red or whatever matches your costumes. And it was really fun. Why they put us in a tutu for a tap routine, I'll never understand. Now, what's so special about tap shoes? Right now, I am not wearing tap shoes. And this is what it sounds like. You can't really hear that, can you? Well, that's where tap shoes come in. Because real tap shoes have metal underneath them, on the toes and on the heels. Now, obviously, these are higher than the flat shoes that I started out with. And then once you start graduating and you become older, you start dancing with higher heeled shoes. Now, see, you would have been able to hear that step had I been wearing these shoes. It's a little ironic that when you're a kid, you start with flat shoes. Then you go to these high heeled shoes. Yet the latest style in tap shoes, we're back to flat shoes again. Now, the reason for that. Take a look at the different heels. Not very much sound, a lot of sound. So when I do that, I'm not really getting a lot of sound. I can get a lot louder, and I can do a lot more complex choreography with a shoe like this. So that's why the style really is the flat shoes now. So we're back to the age of seven. Nobody ever really does just tap especially when you're a kid. You do it all, ballet, jazz, you name it. Enter jazz shoes, because you don't want to be turning with metal shoes, because you might slip. So at this point, we have jazz shoes. They have suede soles, and they allow you to point your toes. Because if you don't have something that's flexible, your 
foot will point and then the shoe will point back up. That's not what you want. So essentially, these are very well-worn shoes. I also have them in black. I also have them in flesh colored. I have a ton of these, but there's always that one trend. These are the same types of shoes, but they were called a jazz boot. I'm not exactly sure what I was thinking, and I've worn them a grand total of one time, which you can see there's almost no wear on the bottom of these shoes. So it's all about the real jazz shoes. Then when you grow up, you start doing shows. And at that point, you again graduate to the high-heeled shoes. These are called character shoes, but this time without metal on the bottom. Of course, we have to have these in different colors as well. And my next performance, I was actually hired by Busch Gardens to dance in the German show. These shoes are from that time. And the first thing that we did here is actually put neolite down at the bottom because we had to go out into the audience and we had to get people to come dance with us. And we called it the Jim Cafetorium. It was where people came to eat, to see the shows, to get a drink, to cool off. The Fest House held 2,000 people. And with choreography with lots of fast turns on the stage, we wanted to make sure that we don't slip when we did things like this. Our job was to circle around a round stage and to actually do those spins. Now, you wanted to make sure that you had some good footing in order to do that. So, Fest House. I have so many shoes. They all look like that. Five years, eight casts. I still have a collection. And then I discovered Ballroom about a year and a half ago. And I found out that there are so many more shoes that could be had. And they were very different. And this is a recent Bolero routine from a showcase. Now, these shoes look completely different. The black ones were good for starters, but it turns out that in ballroom, you have different kinds of shoes for different dances as well. For example, for smooth dances like a waltz and a foxtrot, you have closed toed shoes. You have slightly thicker heels. The reason being, when you start dancing, you're actually, as a woman, pointing with your toe, and then you're doing a heel push as you go. So as you're doing one of these boxes, you're going like this, and then you've got more heel leads as you go into the next step. So these are the kinds of shoes that you use. But the real fun ones are the Latin ones, like these, the ones that I'm wearing. Because in Latin, you don't have heel leads like you do in the waltz and the foxtrot. In Latin, you basically have a lot of forward action, you're, you're on your toes, and it's all about the hip movement. So you're doing kind of a rumba, and you're never actually, your feet don't really leave the ground a whole lot. They're really shushing against the ground, and you're just changing weight. So with the rumba, I don't have to worry about heel leads, and I don't have to worry about pushing off with the heels. That's why these work. The other reason they work is because they work well with the Latin dances, with the costumes. Because there's a whole world of shoes that I'm sure I haven't discovered yet. So in addition to a room for my shoes, I think I'm going to need a room for my ballroom gowns, too. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you very much. Yeah. If you have questions, for time for questions. What is uh, the club you're representing today? Evening Stars and Next Step, both advanced clubs. OK, and how long have you been in? Toastmasters? Uh, since well, six years, 2006. Okay, and what, how do you know when it's time to get rid of a shoe? Do I ever get rid of a shoe? Well, actually, uh, when the I heel starts to wiggle. Time, huh? <laughs> okay. Well, I'll ask you a little bit later then. All okay, right, thank you good. for coming. Thank you. Here now to evaluate Birgit's speech, let's welcome from Xilinx Expressionists in San Jose. Elaine Lung. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Fellow Toastmasters, Birgit, what a lovely speech to introduce us to your hobby. And it sounds like almost a vocation since you've been doing it since you were a child. The vocation that you've uh, chosen to use uh, dancing. I was really fascinated to see all the different shoes that Birgit has been wearing through the years, the tap shoes, the jazz shoes, the character shoes, 
and then we graduated to ballroom and Latin. Quite an array, all here for us to see. Now, I liked how you illustrated your journey through dancing using the shoes. And the point of this speech is to smoothly and effectively use these illustrations to show us the story that you're telling. So the, the pictures that you used, I felt were good. And um, where, from where I was sitting, though, I had a problem with the glare, unfortunately. So hopefully for the television audience, it wasn't the same. So, but I, at least I could see this part down. So I saw the shoes from the pictures. And uh, that, was, that was helpful to me. Now, these shoes that you had, that you brought for us in the bag, they were very clear and, and well thought out. And I thought as you held them and styled them for us, you definitely, we could definitely see them. So that was well done. Also, your use of the taps on the lectern to demonstrate the different noise levels were, were well done as well. And I could definitely see the difference in the taps due to size and also the type of taps. The, now, what I really worked well for me is when you were able to combine this with your dance moves. You did a twirl, you had a little bit of the ballroom, the heel and toe, and the Latin with the hips. That worked really well for me, because then I could see, oh, this is how the shoe is used. So as far as the different shoes were, the tap, I couldn't really see how you were going to use that as well, or the jazz shoes, or the boots, as well as, say, the other two, the ballroom and the Latin. So just for that. Um, also, just as a point of clarity, I think it would help someone like me. I know that you are a dancer and that you dance competitively. But when you started with the picture of yourself as a child, it wasn't really clear. Perhaps maybe you just enjoy ballroom dancing. So explain that at the beginning. Say, I'm a competitive dancer, and now when I go, I have this big bag that I need to take. Kind of just a few sentences about that to get us into the mood that you are definitely going to talk to us about a, a, a wide uh, spectrum of dancing that you've done over the years. So thank you. I really learned a lot about dancing shoes, which was the point of your speech today. And, and I appreciate your coming out today and, and putting this presentation together for us. Thank you, Birgit. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Elaine. And she really is that great in real life, too. Here now with a musical tribute to all of Toastmasters is something called Here's to the People by Robert Van Horn. Master people of first try. 
Here's to you. Welcome back to Toastmasters Bay to Bay. I am your host, Chris Pond from Mandarin English Toastmasters, but today I'm all English. Our second presenter is Kristen Fredericks, and she is doing storytelling number three, Moral of the Story, and the title of her speech is Which Dance to Dance? Please welcome Kristen Fredericks. Years ago, I had a dear friend named Meredith. We always used to say, how much fun would it be if we should start dancing? We used to watch on TV these amazing dancers on Dancing with the Stars or old movies with Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, something we had always sort of fantasized about. Sadly, Meredith passed away a couple years ago. But it was at that moment when I decided to start on a journey of finding this perfect dance, what we had always talked about, giving it a shot. There's so many varieties out there. Why not see what, see what I could do? I had a couple friends who were in the, the dance world and really enjoyed dancing. So I, I asked my one friend, Juanita, she's a very sassy girl, what do you think, where should I start? And she said, Kristen, come with me to a salsa club. So much fun. There's lights and loud music and lots of yummy boys who know how to move their hips. And I thought, all right, how could I go wrong with yummy boys? I said, I'll go, but you need to promise me one thing. First, teach me how to salsa. I don't want to look like a complete fool when I get out there. She said, OK, it's very easy. It's in eight counts. On counts one, two, and three, you're moving your right leg, hold on four, five, six, seven, you move your left, and you hold on eight. I said, okay, I could do this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, not bad. We practiced a couple times. Add in a little arm movement to get the feeling down. Great, I'm ready to go. Well, that night, we got all dressed up, my cutest little outfit, and hit the salsa club. I was so excited. Couldn't stop thinking about Meredith and how excited she would be to, to know that I was doing this. Well, one thing we had not practiced was doing salsa with music. <laughs> As it turns out, music is much faster than how we were counting. So while Meredith, uh, excuse me, my friend Juanita, is looking very cool with her salsa, I was really struggling. She looked like this. Oh, yes, having some fun, dancing in the club, woo! Meanwhile, I look like this. Wah! Wah! <sighs> well, one sprained ankle later, I found out salsa was not for me. <laughs> but that's OK. Before I even had a chance to think about giving up, I had another friend jump in, help me carry on this dream that I had. And she said, Kristen, I know what you need. You are much too classy for salsa. You need to try some ballet. <sighs> well, OK, I'll give it a try. But I don't know, I just, I'm not sure about it. My friend Yvette said, look at this brochure. It's so elegant. I took a look at it. I turned it over, and on the back was an advertisement for a swing dancing class. 
And I remember that Meredith had told me stories her grandmother had shared with her about her, her grandmother dancing the Lindy Hop in the Charleston back in the 40s, and what a great time her grandmother had had. And I asked my friend Yvette, hey, you know, have you ever tried this uh, swing dancing class? It's at the same studio. What do you think? Kristen, you are far too sophisticated for that rubbish. <sighs> All right, forget it, forget it. Let's, let's try ballet. So she promised to go with me to the basic beginner class. So you have one hand on the bar, and the other hand is free. And at first, the instructor did a great job of really walking us through exactly what to do. You have one hand out, and we're just doing some very small kicks. And I thought, OK, so I can, I can do this. This is much slower, much calmer. I can handle this. Slowly, I, I start to realize the instructor is walking around the room looking every girl up and down to make sure that what they were doing was correct. And she would give them a nod before moving on to assess the next girl. As I see the instructor starting to go around the room, very, very nervous. She looked very, very serious. Finally, she comes over to me. I am trying my best to do what I think is correct. And she tells me, Kristen, straighten your leg. <laughs> Instinctively, I straighten everything. <laughs> no, bend your arm. <laughs> Not that much. <laughs> now keep your chest up. <laughs> but keep your head pointed to the left. <laughs> but up a little. <laughs> now do all this looking relaxed and serene. <laughs> <sighs> well, found out that way ballet is not for me either. But it didn't stop there. I was prudent in my quest. I tried tap. I tried hip hop. I tried tango, both American and Argentine. I tried waltz. I tried belly dancing. Nothing seemed to speak to me, though. <sighs> Feeling very discouraged one day, I decided to take a walk in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. And not even realizing it, I, I found myself walking towards some music that was playing. And I realized it was a group of people swing dancing in the park. And I thought, how did, well, what happened? How did I end up here? This is, wow, not expected at all. And I sat there for a minute and I thought, why am I sitting here? I'm going to get up. I'm going to dance. I'm going to enjoy this. And in that moment, I realized I had learned a very important lesson. In my quest to find this perfect dance, I had completely forgotten about having fun. And there is no such thing as a perfect dance. Dancing is meant to be imperfect. It's meant to have fun and just move your body however makes you happy. And that was my lesson and what Meredith really taught me. So my only question for you, swing, swing. Swing dancing may not be right for everybody, but which dance will you dance? Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you so much, Kristen. Now, which club are you from? I'm representing Evening Stars today. Evening Stars, another Evening Stars representative. <laughs> and how long have you been in Toastmasters? I've been in Toastmasters for five years. Okay, so you mentioned ballet is what you started with. What would you recommend for men? Do you like wearing tights? <laughs> I'll answer that off the air. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Here now to evaluate Kristen's speech, let's welcome from San Mateo Toastmasters, Mr. Extraordinaire Tony De Leon. <laughs> Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, but most of all, Kristen. Christian, I just loved your speech. What I loved most was the excitement that you created and the descriptions of all the dances that you explored. You borrowed a little bit from Goldilocks and the Three Bears, and it's a familiar theme, but the way you presented it was with excitement and really from a viewpoint when you reflect back from days or years ago, time spent with a friend talking about dance. So you actually went this journey where you really tried a few dances and 
like anybody who was a beginner, you thought, started talking to folks that have some experience in dance. Juanita, I would love to meet her. The, the way you described her, the energy, and of course, the struggle of dancing. You demonstrated that really well. Then, I really liked your conversation you had with the Yvette, the ballet, and the snobbiness that she had. You really did that role play and portrayed that really well. I also loved the way you used the lectern as the bar, and you described the instructor going around the room and how you waited, anticipating that you were doing everything right. And I love the little sound effect that you had, that little eh, eh, eh. It was, for me, very effective. Your delivery was well-paced, very easy for all of us to be where you are. And I think that's what, for me, brought it home, is that you allow us to enter your space and you were able to tell us how you felt in those moments. Now I'm struggling to come up with some different uh, things that you could do differently next time around. And maybe I would just use the stage a little bit differently since we explored three different types of dance is maybe dance one here, dance two here, dance three over here, your walk to the park, rediscovering where you are so we're back in the center of the stage. And I would have maybe loved to see a little more, oh, where's that music? But I just loved your speech. Looking forward to hearing you speak again. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. That's all we have time for today, folks. For more information about Toastmasters, visit d4tm.org. I am your host, Chris Pond. I bid you adieu, and may all your speech dreams come true.